So, uh, Tim, I'm giving up on uh, talk. I'm not going to talk about Women's World Cup until it's all over. <laughs> okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just my nerves are uh, far too frayed, and I'm uh, I, I just can't can't get into it. Um, the the France Brazil game is what what really kind of did me in. I I'm uh, what, what was the what were the what it well, it went to overtime and uh, France won two to one in overtime. But there was it was it was just there were too many red, yellow cards, too many ugly tackles, a goal that was called off. You know, it just bad bad officiating, which will always kill everything. Yeah. But you know, it is how it is. Uh, but anyway, you know, I'm also getting old. And I know you're older than I am, so yeah, no, I'm not doing you any that, favors. That worries me there. But but uh, here's how I know I'm getting old. So I thought, you know, at first I felt I was getting old when I realized that William Devane was trying to sell me gold. <laughs> yeah. I thought, okay, that's that's not good. And then uh, and then the six million dollar man was trying to sell me hearing aids. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Jonathan Hart and Magnum started trying to sell me reverse mortgages. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? And then today I heard a commercial. And uh, Mary Lou Retton is trying to sell me menopause medication. Oh yeah, I saw that one too. And and uh, I'm uh, I, it's it's all over. Yeah. Mary, Mary Lou Retton uh, selling hawking uh, menopause. Yeah. I know I can't. Uh, I can't. One step one step over from those diapers, man. Can't do it. I can't do it. One yeah. step over from those diapers. Yeah. They're all doing it though. You know, Ernie Ernie Hudson's out there. You know Ernie. Oh yeah. Ernie Hudson's hawking. Still looks great though. Still looks fantastic, which is why it's so weird. I'm like Ernie. <laughs> dude, why are you what what the hell are you selling this? <laughs> crap for a television what are you doing oh, yeah, yeah but you know, well i should set up they're all making way more money than yeah well it is what it is uh it is what it is so anyway yeah not much on the on the movie front we're still uh so we are um we are off uh for a week after this fourth of july holiday it's gonna be a lovely long weekend mm-hmm. and we are gonna have a great time weather is really heating up here so uh oh, we for those who who listen from other countries you're just going to have to enjoy our holiday with us. Uh, otherwise, if you're in the U.S., we're going to wish you a great uh, July 4th holiday. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a fantastic weekend. And uh, we've got a couple of giveaways this week. It's going to be going to be toasty on the West Coast. It is. It is. It's starting to F- really. Finally, actually, yeah. because it hasn't been. We were, uh, having, we were having rain, like crazy rain. Yeah. The first day of summer, I was over here, and it rained. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 the longest day of the year, it was no sun. <laughs> because it was because showers are, and in the Midwest where nice. my where my mom and my you know my family is yeah. the same thing uh, torrential rains flooding uh, all, I'm from St Louis all yeah. through there all that all that stuff is going on there but uh, the second day of summer it kicked in you know right it's, 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 uh, yeah shooting up to the nineties now yeah so. well I'm gonna I'm gonna go find a pool to jump in somewhere. So I am going to start off with uh, From the Sublime to the Ridiculous, and then we're going to get into the new movies. We've got Foreign Language today. Mm-hmm. We're going to do a couple of giveaways from the uh, courtesy of Wellgo from the uh, stack of foreign films. Uh, some Naxo stuff from the, on, the, on the music front, the classical music front. Most of these, or at least three of these, are from Unitel, but I'm going to start off from, with one from Naxos proper. Um, this is an opera I've never heard of. It's kind of weird, kind of freaky. Uh, I don't really understand it. This is performed by the Dutch National Opera. It's called, as a French title, L'Etoile by Emmanuel Chabrier. If you are, this is the uh, chorus of Dutch of the Dutch National Opera and the uh, uh, the Residency Orc Orchest of uh, the Hog. I don't even know what that is, but mm. anyway, it's the Dutch National Dutch National Opera, and uh, this is just strange uh i find it, it really is i find most most modern uh operas to be a, a little bit odd and off the beaten path uh, if if you um, i mean look it's just it's very postmodern and kind of avant-garde uh but it's called l'etoile music's fine i guess i didn't you know not gonna get into it too much uh, Rossini's uh, Le Comte Ori, Count Ori, uh is uh is from unitel and c major and it's uh, it's fine. I'm you know Rossini. I'm kind of up and down with the Rossini. This is from the uh, the orchestra, the Champs Elysees, and uh, conductor Louis Langre in Paris. Um, it's fine. And Puccini's Tosca doesn't get any better. Even if you don't like opera, you're gonna absolutely love this. This is from the, this is from the uh, the opera people in Dresden, Germany. Uh, Christian Thielmann and the Staatskapelle Dresden. It's absolutely stunning. It is wonderful. Uh, Tosca is, of course, one of the all-time great operas, and uh, for good reason. And this really, really does it uh, does it right. This is uh, absolutely terrific. Tosca, by the way, I didn't realize was premiered in 1900. Isn't that phenomenal? 
Oh, man. 1900. Uh, so uh, anyway, the what's interesting here is that the, the they analogize this in some ways uh, with the notes that they furnished us to Goodfellas, which I had never heard before, but it is certainly interesting. Uh, and then uh, also from Unitel is a uh, a Mahler and Zimmerman concert combination. This is the uh, Bayerischen Rundfunks Choir and the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, conducted by Andres Nelsons. They perform the uh, Mahler Symphony Number no. Two, otherwise known as the Resurrection, and then uh, some works by the composer Zimmerman. Two ends at the end with Bernd Alois Zimmerman, with whom I'm not that familiar, mm. but the music's quite good. Uh, and uh, the soloist, the soprano soloist Lucy Crow, has a lovely, lovely voice. I'm not always a huge fan of operatic sopranos, but that's absolutely beautiful. And then lastly, from uh, RAICOM, R A I C O M, uh, which is Italian, and C major, is uh, Verdi's Attila. And uh, this is done by the chorus and orchestra of uh, Teatro Comunale di Bologna, the communal theater of Bologna in Italy, conducted uh, by Michel Mariotti. And uh, it's, uh, this is also quite good. Uh, when you let the Italians just kind of do it classically, it's very, very impressive. A lot of scale here, beautiful audio, really, really nicely recorded. And uh, it's just, you know, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Mm. And from the sublime... I'll take us to the ridiculous. So I got some some culty and some horror stuff here. I'm going to combine all the culty stuff and the horror stuff and uh, try to go through it as quickly as possible. This is a low-budget horror film called Dead Sight, all one word, uh, with the tagline, You'll never see them coming. <laughs> And and it's got a it. it's got a picture of some kind of half eaten zombie headed guy with one eye. It's kind of disgusting, yeah. but you know mm. that's how that's how these things sell. Uh, yeah. So so usually these stories are about somebody who's about to retire, aka Danny Glover in uh, Lethal Weapon. You know, oh, I only got forty eight more hours left before I'm retiring. Oh, I don't. I'm too old for this. Right, all that stuff. Uh, they've decided to one-up it now. So you've got a, a woman police officer who's about to go on maternity leave. Oh, that really ups the ante. And on her last day, her last day before going on maternity leave, um, she, um, she winds up um, having to team up with a blind guy to fight zombies. Yeah. I, look, I don't know how else to put it. It's a pregnant lady and a blind guy fighting zombies. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm sorry. I, it, it's you win right there because <laughs> you've made you you found a premise for a zombie movie that is incomprehensibly ridiculous, mm-hmm. and yet it's never been done before. So I I tip my hat to you. Pregnant lady and a blind guy fighting zombies. It's I don't know. It it, it should have been a comedy, but it's not. Uh, so also from Blue Underground, who does a lot of great cult stuff, they came out with a three-disc limited edition Blu-ray, which includes a DVD and a compact disc. It's Blu-ray, DVD, and compact disc, uh, restored from 4K uh, from the original elements in 4K. Lucio Fulci, one of the original Giallo directors from Italy, Lucio Fulci's movie The New York Ripper. Uh, I, I don't know that I really need a uh, lenticular hologrammed cover three disc special edition uh, remastered in 4K on Blu-ray of uh, of a really, really nasty psychopathic horror film. But if that's your thing, mm. this is certainly one of the more legendary ones. Um, I find the extras on here a whole lot more interesting than the movie. The, the movie itself, you know, Lucio Fulci is not the most polished of the Giallo directors. He's certainly not as... He's one of the early ones. He's one of the early ones, yeah. I mean, he's, he, you know, by the time you get to Dario Argento, you're much more into an art film kind of sensibility. Lucio Fulci didn't care. He just he made him quick and dirty and nasty. And, uh, you know, the, nothing's nastier than his movie Zombie. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is more or less the same kind of thing. In New York Ripper, you know, it is, it, 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 it's exactly what the title is. And uh, it's just a whole lot of gore, and it's nasty and really repulsive. However, uh, you get an, the author of Splintered Visions, Lucio Fulci, and his films, Troy Howarth, doing an audio commentary that will make you feel very guilty, actually, for not liking this film more. Yeah. Uh, and interviews with almost everybody involved. Tons and tons and tons of interviews. 
And uh, then there's a poster in Still Gallery and the trailer and a thing on their uh, their locations, the New York locations, how they've changed over time. Actually, you watch the extras and you kind of go, well, maybe it wasn't that bad, but it is. It's bad. The extras are very, very good. Uh, I'll Take Your Dead. That's the name of the movie. I'll Take Your Dead. And this also has a fun tagline. Death is knocking at their door. I don't even know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it does, I didn't know death had uh, you know, <laughs> it's, fingers in it. Okay. Anyway, uh, so this is uh, this is about a guy who uh, he he basically is. I don't want to call it a graveyard, but he's uh, he makes he he enables uh, corpses to disappear to to no longer be an issue. Uh, you know, there there are all of these uh, gang murders around in the area, and uh, you know he's he's got a farmhouse, and you can dispose of the the problematic material here and all that, and um, the, the somehow that dovetails into a haunted house story. Now, I I'm not gonna co- tell you exactly how because I'm not really sure how. Uh, it, by by the time they kind of start to explain things, it it makes even less sense than when they weren't explaining it. However, there's a lot of good mood here. So even though it doesn't make a great deal of sense, the director Chant, uh, Chad Archibald um, really is using this as a resume piece, and that's fine. That's what a lot of these people do. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's strictly a Blu-ray, no DVD. And it does have a behind-the-scenes and deleted scenes bit on it and, uh, and a script-to-screen thing that's not really that impressive. Um, but um, So the movie has all kinds of problems, uh, mainly in the script stage, but it's, it's in the end, uh, not as problematic as you might think. From art exploitation films is um, what they would like to believe is going to be a future cult classic called Rondo. Not sure it's... Uh, it is, as they suggest, a cult classic in the making, but it certainly has a, a real kind of a cool low-budget noir style to it. And uh, the uh, it's about a guy who goes to uh, this 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 uh, uh, veteran who is war veteran who goes uh, to uh, a brothel, and the brothel is, winds up being. Um, is sort of opening him, opening up a, a, a an additional underworld that is even sleazier and nastier than uh, than a brothel normally would be. Uh, <laughs> it's I, they 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 are they're trying to suggest this is kind of a black comedy. I didn't laugh, yeah. and I watched more than half of it and decided it wasn't worth it. So, and then we also have uh, this is pretty good low budget stuff. Uh, the cleaning lady. Uh, beware the cleaning lady. We take them all for granted, don't we? We, you know, at yeah. least if you, if you, whether whether it's at work, whether it's at your home, if you have a, if you have some kind of a cleaning lady, you know, you 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 trust them. You 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 get to know them over time, and you they have access to all of your stuff in the bathroom, things that you would never show to your best friends, yeah. right? So this is basically single white female uh, with the cleaning lady. You got a woman who's you know got a boyfriend who has a double life and. And, you know, life's messed up. She brings in a cleaning lady to, you know, sort of help. Uh, anyway, the cleaning lady kind of becomes a confidant. And beca- pretty soon the cleaning lady develops a very unhealthy obsession with the woman for whom she is working. And uh, you, you, you know where it goes from there. It goes south. Uh, <laughs> it does. Uh, from Intervision, we get a real total cult film. And it's really, really good just grindhouse dirty like you can't even imagine uh this is called masked mutilator Mm. that's right masked mutilator it comes in the black keep case that they reserve for blu-rays that they really want to scare the daylights out of you and uh this was all shot for about uh 99 cents in 1994 in eastern pennsylvania and it was the the brainchild of a bunch of professional wrestlers in Pennsylvania, a bunch of Pennsylvania wrestlers um, who th- they wanted to make just basically a low-budget slasher film and uh, were never able to actually finish it. It took them like over 20 years to get around to finishing it. And uh, here it is. It's now out uh, in this form, and I don't know why it took them 20 years because it just isn't... There's nothing here that should have taken 20 years. I think somebody just shoved all the elements away and didn't want to bother with it. And now that there's an outlet for it, they got around to it. Um, 
look, it's nasty, it's dirty, it doesn't make any sense, it's purely for gore and gratification. Uh, but there is something interesting about the fact that this was thrown together by a bunch of non-professionals in eastern Pennsylvania 25 years ago. So there is value to that, and you learn a great deal about it because they have a cast and crew commentary where they talk about it. And I would frankly say if you can tolerate the content, which is pretty disgusting, uh, just watch it straight up with the audio commentary on. Mm. It's, it's only an hour and 15 minutes long. It blows right by. It's got a lot of other extras on it, a lot of interviews and, and featurette stuff. But uh, And they, they even include the auditions, which is um, a little horrifying. Almost more horrifying than the movie. But the commentary is really, it makes it interesting while you're watching it. So I would say that's the thing you want to do. And then uh, from Mondo Macabro, who also releases a lot of fun stuff, uh, from the French director Jean Brisme, is uh, The Devil's Nightmare. Now, uh, The Devil's Nightmare uh, it has, a, this is kind of a, a mid-grindhouse movie from Belgium, actually, uh, in 1971. And it, I've, I had heard of this before. I had never actually, I was not familiar with what was in it. It, it sort of has a Euro slasher of following. There are people who love all the Euro slasher stuff specifically because mm -hmm. it, it looks a little bit like soft core, but then people start dying and cutting each other apart and there it is. Uh, so uh, for what it is from that genre, I guess it's half a notch above most of that stuff. But it still doesn't work. It still has, it's still basically a cheap Agatha Christie knockoff, bunch of people, you know, a bunch of tourists. Uh, their bus takes, a, you know, a wrong, a wrong turn and uh, next thing you know, you've got kind of a weird European castle version of uh, And Then There Were None, which in a way is sort of like some European variation on The Hills Have Eyes uh -huh. or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They're all kind of in the same vein. But uh, the castle is certainly really funky and, and creepy and weird. But uh, otherwise, it, it doesn't really make any sense. It's just a, a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of gothic gore. And, it, it you know, it's silly. But, you know. I'm 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 not going to be judgmental. And then the last one here is the 27 Club, uh, which actually co-stars Todd Rundgren. Oh, yeah. I don't know Todd Rundgren Rocker. showed up in movies. Yeah. Weird thing. But he, club, those, he he's basically rockers who tapped out. Yeah, he's basically playing himself here. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it, it's about a it's about a singer songwriter a a rock guy, um, who uh, winds up being kind of drawn into this weird culty odyssey that leads him to the uh, mysterious 27th 27 club. Uh, and really the only reason that this exists is for the CD that they include with this, which obviously has Todd Rundgren on it mm -hmm. uh, and Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. And, you know, there's a, it, it, the, it's really for the music. It's like a giant gory music video. Uh, and this is from Cleopatra Entertainment and MVD. It is the 27 Club, so see it only if you're a Todd Rundgren fan, mm -hmm. which our friend Rich Nachesky is. By the way, I, I saw Rich the other day. He came yeah, by. you sent me a note. Yeah, yeah. Rich is, a, is an old uh, colleague of ours from the Entertainment Today days. He was the music editor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I haven't heard from him in years. Hey, he's, Rich. He's doing really well. He's doing really well. Outstanding. Knock off a few new movies? Yeah, let's do the new movies. Uh, new, newest kind of wacky movies anyway. Uh, so um, got this Dolph Lundgren film. It's called <laughs> Dead Trigger. Blu-ray. Uh, uh, guess what Dolph is doing on the cover? Uh, oh, hold, hold uh, he's gun. holding a daisy. Yeah. No, it's a gun. <laughs> That's it's a, a gun. gun. Yes, a gun. He's holding a gun. He's, Dolph, smelling, he's smelling a flower. <laughs> Dolph has just been doing this for years and years and years and years. Anyway, this is um uh, this is one of these post-apocalyptic thing of virus that's killed sure. billions of people. Uh, and uh, you, basically, it's like a World War Z kind of thing. It created sure. zombies because you got if the virus is going to kill a bunch of people, they got to come back as zombies. Or that wouldn't be any fun. Anyway, um, the the hook is this: the government creates this uh, zombie killing game. Uh, people go online, they play the game. Then the government recruits the best players of this game to be led by our Captain Dolph Lundgren here to go out and kill the hordes of zombies. Uh, you know, lovely. Makes sense to me. If you're good at killing them in the game, sure. you're, you're probably going to be good at killing them pretty much in any place you can kill them. Haley Lou Richardson and Cole Sprouse in this pub, perfectly lovely little film called Five Feet Apart. I adored this little movie when it came out. I think I talked about it on the radio. Um, it's just this little, little uh, 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 young woman has cystic fibrosis, uh, and uh, she's in the hospital all the time. She meets a young man who's also in the hospital quite a, beat, quite a bit. 
they can't get anywhere near each other because they'll infect each other and probably kill each other. Yet they fall in love. Man, yeah. you know. Uh, okay. It's not, right. You know, look, you can, can possibly be more contrived, but you know what? <laughs> These kids are cute, and, and, and it was just sort of lovely. A, a very notebooky kind of thing. Um, uh, so, you know, it works in that sort of way. A lot of neat special features on this, including an audio commentary uh, and a making of sort of a little video that's kind of cool, too. John Travolta and Morgan Freeman and The Poison Rose. Um, man, John Travolta and Morgan Freeman in this little thriller movie that's not that bad. Been kicking John Travolta in the butt for mm-hmm. a few years now. John Travolta hasn't made anything no. watchable for quite a while. No. Well, look, Travolta's career has gone through a very, very interesting rhythm, which is that he he was a TV actor mm-hmm. who then became a movie star with Grease and Saturday Night Fever. I mean, he had that moment right in the late 70s, early 80s. He mm-hmm. was the deal. And then he traded it all in for just garbage, yeah. and he just and he vanished, and he and he was doing just junk at a certain point. I think uh, Two of a Kind was yeah. one of his last yeah. attempts at, at regaining legitimacy, which he did with Olivia, yeah. uh, with Oliver Reed playing the devil's horrible, horrible movie. <laughs> um, but uh, and then Pulp Fiction gave him a new release on life, and suddenly he had like five or six films in a row that yeah. made over a hundred million dollars. Uh, right through Broken Arrow, you know, yeah, mo- mostly playing these sort of bad guys of one sort or another, which was an interesting twist yeah. because he had been the heroic leading man, yeah, for so long. You and, know, and, and he-, he had that momentary resurgence, and then he and then he made uh, the uh, the L. Ron Hubbard thing. Oh my uh, goodness! Yeah, ba- uh, Battlefield, Earth. Battlefield Earth. Yeah, and then it all just went to crap again. Did he direct that too, or did he produce? I know he produced. No, he produced it. it. Yeah, he did not yeah, direct. Did not direct it. Yeah. Anyway, what are you going to do? Uh, John and Morgan Freeman in this movie, along with uh, Brendan Fraser, who you'll remember from The Mummy, Lo- uh, uh, yeah. uh, way back yeah. in the day. Anyway, uh, John's playing this LA cop, has to go back to his hometown in Galveston, Texas, when a young woman goes missing. He's looking for this young woman. Uh, and Morgan Freeman is playing this uh, criminal mob bossy kind of guy. Frazier is just sort of sleazy doctor kind of guy. Something is going on. Mm. Uh, John is getting pissy because uh, these people aren't telling him the truth. Though, so he has to figure it out. It's actually a pretty good little sharp, sharp little thriller uh, of a movie there, Poison in the Rose. Not much on it in the way of special features, which kind of sucks a little bit. You and I talked about this fast color. Uh, a film about a young woman, in yeah. this case a young black woman, played by Guga and Mb- Beth Raw, uh, who was in that wonderful movie Beyond the Lights a couple of few years and, ago. And who did, uh, who played the uh, Feather Duster in Beauty and the Beast. In Beauty and the Beast, yeah. exactly. Uh, uh, just uh, fantastic. Um, she is, and she's this young woman with superhuman powers. This blew right past me. Blew I, right I, past I, me. I, I, I'm, I, th- I, I have to believe this had a theatrical release, but it, uh, it was not on my radar. I just, I, I just, can't, I can't believe that it, that it, that it didn't. Lorraine Toussaint is in it too. Yeah. And this is a movie about a young woman with superhero powers. She's being chased by the supervillain. She has to go back home uh, to the farm community that she yeah. ran away from years ago because you know they sort of they sort yeah. of drove her away actually. Yeah. And the and the whole story sort of plays out. I love this little wicked ass movie. It's called Fast Color. Uh, check it out. I'm a big fan of uh, of Google. Google is is really really an incredible. She's going to win an Oscar within the next few years. Yeah, uh, it's just it's it's one of those moments. Just need the right role, but yeah. a huge talent and beautiful. Yeah, uh, uh, audio commentary cosplay. here with the director writer Julia Hart. Yeah, so yeah. you know, neat there. Uh, Emilio Estevez back at work. Emilio had a talk about the guy he had a moment yeah. there in his career as an as a as a director. Emilio was a little artur M- there. Mighty Ducks. Mighty du- Mighty Ducks was his big 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 hit. That was the one. Interestingly, yeah. after the Mighty Ducks is when he started to taper off. Yeah. As a director, I did that movie called The War and a, and a few yeah. others. But in the eighties, he was running around. Uh, yeah. I mean, because yeah, I mean, you know the family. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, he made he made uh, Men Re- at Work uh, too. Men at Work and yeah. uh, uh, Repo Man, and uh, he did. He was running when he was running around with Demi Moore. Wisdom. Yeah. Uh, was 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 a big one. He, he was he was he was writing. He was directing. He was acting. He was uh, you know. Uh, I mean, even even uh, Breakfast Club. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, hell yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was he was doing a lot of stuff and uh, wearing all these hats, and then uh, some of it was good. So it was. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is a movie called The Public. It's um, it's a, you know sort of an activist film that he made. He, he directed like his, this one. He directed this. Yeah. His, his dad is a, he and his dad are a bit of a are, are, are activists filmmakers. Yeah. They always sort of have been. So um, it, it's set in a, a horrible, horrible winter in Cincinnati. Uh, the windchill factory is something insane. Uh, the homeless people who have been living on the street decide to take over the public library. 
they go into the public library and uh, and stage, you know, a sit-in, really. What they're trying to do is stay alive, and this is all about how the powers that be are going to react to that. It's a real sort of... Um, in a certain sort of way, a sort of uh, uh, one of those sort of um, oh, the, the, with Pacino, um, yeah, uh, you know, one of those kind of things, you know, with with the with, and a lot of these people, like sort of a Desicus sort of situation, are actual homeless people that he's put in the film. Uh, Michael K. Williamson, and Alec Baldwin, and, and Emilio himself is in the fi- in the film. Uh, Gabrielle Union and Jenna Malone and Michael K- uh, and Taylor Sh- Schilling, Christian Slater. So a lot of people in the film, but every now and again he ha- has a person in the film who's an actual homeless person, and they and they sort of speak off the cuff. It's a it's, it's kind of an interesting, moving little movie. And it's cool to see Emilio back at work. Uh, uh, a few special features on here as well. Stallone, Curtis Jackson, who I noticed doesn't use that 50 cent anymore. No, he doesn't. <laughs> it's funny, right? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, you it's lost like, It's like Dwayne Johnson isn't The Rock anymore. Yeah. You yeah. lose the moniker at a certain point. Yeah, Chris, Ludacris, that's yeah, gone too. Nah. Uh, now he's just Curtis Jackson and Dave yeah. Batista in this film, Escape Plan, The Extractors. It's a movie about uh, Stallone and his team of badasses who have to uh, go and uh, uh, get back the kidnapped daughter of this yeah. high Hong Kong tech mogul. Uh, and that's really all it is. <laughs> that's yeah. nothing, really just absolutely nothing yeah. else to say about it. A lot of special features there, though, including the making of and a commentary track with the uh, director, John Hertzfeld. You know, John Hertzfeld uh, used to be the man. Yeah, I know. You know, for, yeah. for, for, for a long time. A uh, lot of these guys are, are just kind of uh, floating around out there, and, mm-hmm. and uh, they had these A-list studio careers, and mm-hmm. now they're – Kind of scraping. The, I mean, a lot of them will come back again. So. Yeah, you think you think particularly you know, go to television. Do not step off in television. Yep. Yep. Uh, Mia and the White Lion on Blu-ray here. This is a lovely movie about a young woman and her gigantic white lion uh, as she sort of hikes her way across the South African savanna in order to get that lion uh, to a place where it will be safe because sh- both she and it are being tracked by people who mean to do uh, at least the lion harm and will do her harm uh, if they if they have to happen to catch him. This is a lovely little film. Um, uh, to um, uh, truly appealing, and I'm sure a lot of folks will like it. They should check it out if they get a chance. Uh, Dumbo, man, Disney's Disney's desire to live action anize, or that's not a, that's not actually a phrase, but to make in live action all of its classics uh, animation. I don't know this one. Th- Tim Burton, of course, directing Danny DeVito. Michael Keaton is actually having a lot of fun in the film. Colin Farrell uh, at Ava Green. I don't know, man. Uh, this We went to see this together. I, I, I took a friend of mine's uh, little daughter to go see it. She had a good time at the movie. It did not do well. I was not crazy about Aladdin either, although it did do well. Wh- what are your feelings about uh, Disney in this attempt to uh, so live I'm, action these movies? I, I Mixed feelings. I think some of them work, and I think others don't. I think Aladdin is a real mixed bag, wrong director. Uh, I thought Beauty and the Beast was very sweet. My daughter loves Beauty and the Beast. She, she, you know, it kind of pushed all their buttons from the uh, from the animated. Yeah. she still prefers the animated. I thought that movie was so so big and intense and overbearing. I, uh, you know, it's yeah, funny. I, I I don't like the Jungle Book, but I understand why people do. Mm. I I'm hopeful the Lion King will be decent, but it still feels like mm. I think the animated film kind of told that story as well as it needed to be told. Yeah. Uh, as far as Dumbo's concerned, it's a different Dumbo. It's Tim Burton's Dumbo. It's a Dumbo. different storyline, too. It's, it's not, it's, it doesn't follow the story. There's not exactly. No, there's no mouse. Uh, yeah, there's this family with, uh, you know, Colin Farrell is, 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 has lost his arm in the war. This, I mean, they've, they've invented a whole, in the kids, yeah, it's a whole new angle on the idea. The, pretty much the only thing that's, that's similar is that there's an evil circus guy who's trying to take advantage of Dumbo the Flying Elephant and yeah. fails to. That's it. Everything else is reconstructed, and it's a Tim Burton movie. If you want Disney's Dumbo, watch the original. Yeah. If you want to see what Tim Burton can do with the idea of a flying elephant, yeah. well, then this is worth watching. Yeah. I, I don't think it's bad. And which means it'll be a little bit darker, a little bit scarier, to yeah. my mind. Oh, okay. yeah. A it, lot it, scarier. It is. And you should I wouldn't show it to that. my daughter. I, I wouldn't show it to, show it to any little kids no. either. Uh-uh. Um, do you want me to knock off this television before we move on? Or you want to knock yeah, off, knock off the TV. Well, actually, you know what? I got one more new movie over here that I want to make a mention of. Okay. Uh, Maze. Uh, Maze was, was in theaters rather briefly, but it is, it is a, it's a hell of a movie. And I'm sorry that it didn't get a uh, a bigger release theatrically. So you really should check it out. So if you're familiar with the with the IRA hunger strike history, mm-hmm. Bobby Sands. If you've seen the movie Hunger, the Steve McQueen film, uh, with uh, with uh, Michael uh, Fassbender, uh, Fassbender yeah. playing Bobby Sands, then you you know that story. Bobby Sands being one of the the IRA uh, protesters. 
uh, who was in prison. They went on hunger strike for their treatment, and and uh, they uh, almost all of them, nearly all of them, wound up dying. Yeah. And it's it's just this horrible, horrible moment in the history of the the, the Northern Ireland IRA, uh, the the war in Northern Ireland. And what's not often talked about is that in 1983, that not all of them who were on hunger strike died. Yeah. The in, in and some were transferred to uh, a high security prison known as the Maze. Yeah, and force fed. And and yeah, and force fed, and the whole thing. And and what wound up happening was that one of them. Uh, wound up orchestrating in 1983 the single most successful, the single biggest breakout from a high security prison in the history of the United Kingdom. Wow. And 38 IRA prisoners uh, escaped from the maze. This is that story, how it was planned, how they methodically were able to communicate with each other to sort of, uh, you know, work the guards, look at the geography of the, uh, of the prison. Uh, you know how you just sort of put it to, how you put it together, and it's really amazing. It's it's a puzzle that took a long time to put together, but it's rather brilliant. Mm. Even if you're not rooting for them to escape, even if you think that these guys are criminal bastards, which you may, mm. I don't. Yeah, I, it doesn't, it that. doesn't really matter what side of all but, this you're but on. The thing and how it happened is nevertheless a fascinating story. It is fascinating. It is like great escape. Fascinating. It is a really, really, really top notch film, uh, written and directed by Stephen Burke. Hell of a job. Give that man a lot more work. Escalate him. Put it, send him right up the, the chain of command. Let him put some more movies together because he knows how to make a movie. Um, uh, Tom Von Lawler, Barry Ward, Martin McCann. These guys are actors you have probably seen in bit parts in British television for a long time. Don't worry about it. You're going to see a lot more of them. Yeah. Everybody in this is really, really intense. This thing won uh, four Irish Film and TV Academy Awards. It is, uh, it is first rate. It's on Blu-ray. Check it out. It's called Maze. Definitely a good film. Outstanding. Uh, Hit the TV. A couple of, co- couple of quick TVs yeah. here. from. Uh, well, the first one is from Acorn anyway. Martin Clunes uh, and a, uh, a series called Manhunt. Love Based Martin Clunes. Mar- love Martin. You know, Doc Martin. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, my mother loves that, too. Still watches it all every day. Um, uh, here he's playing a detective. Uh, who's on the trail of uh, a serial killer. This is all based on a true story. So a French uh, student is found in Twickenham Green in London. Uh, and uh, the, 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 you know, the fairly um, uh, uh, quiet, uh, and, but, you know, uh, um, um, decent DCI of the town is set out on the task of figuring out who killed this girl. Very quickly he fills yeah. out that this is not just a killing of a single girl, that there's actually a serial killer at work. And he has to, to press forward in figuring out what to do. And how he does it is what this is all about uh, in his very methodical way. Uh, as the town completely goes bananas, the, the public is demanding answers to the media, all of that is going on. Again, based on a true story. Uh, and it's a very well put together, a very well put together uh, um, film called Manhunt, starring Martin Clunes there. Interestingly, a similar um, uh, story is told in Marcella season two. Uh, this time we have DC Marcella uh, Backland, who is a London police officer mm-hmm. who finds herself on the trail of a serial killer after the body of a, of a young woman is found. Dude, what the hell is up with I, these I serial know. killers in London? I know. You know, yeah. uh, since uh, since Jack the Ripper, it seems that they they just can't stop. Nevertheless, these are all very well made television series. Uh, they're dark and they're brutal. In this one, the hook is this: a body is found inside a wall. Yep. Uh, she's called there to investigate this. It turns out the body is the body of a little boy who went missing some years ago while walking with her own son. Oh. Uh. Her own son. And, you know, yeah, obviously, you know, it very easily could have been her son and one of those kind of things, and now she's on this case. So uh, the context in which they set these things are often as interesting as the narratives about the mysteries themselves, finding out who the killer is. Sometimes in these British dramas, the context is everything. Anyway, Anna Friel in Marcella season two. Love Anna Friel so Good much. Stuff. Good stuff. Going all the way back to the Land Girls. Been yeah. Such a huge fan that whole time. All right. Let's, uh, I'm going to hit some foreign here real quickly. Uh, we got giveaways. We're going to give away four copies of each of these movies. And the first one, they're both POW themed, and they're both from Wellgo, and we really appreciate it. Uh, And uh, the first one is called Swing Kids. Now, it's not to be confused 
with the uh, the other movie, Swing Kids, with Swing oh, Heil, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Swing Heil, that whole horrible yeah. thing about kids during Germany showing protest against Hitler by doing swing dancing and yeah. whatnot. That's directed no. by Thomas Carter. If I don't yeah, think, it's yeah. Not, not 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 good. Uh, this is uh, an Annapurna Finance Korean film, believe it or not, which is set during the Korean War. And it's about a POW camp uh, where they they basically put together a you know a, a musical number. They do musical theater t- as a way of kind of keeping their sanity and uh, giving themselves uh, a new sense of reality, a new sense of hope. And it it's it's really quite unusual and very enjoyable. And uh, it's it, it's a pretty smart film. Uh, it's it it's not what they're usually making in Korea these days. So it's I, I'm I'm grateful that somebody kind of. Um, was able to get the Annapurna money to put this thing together and make it uh, make it real. Yeah. We're giving four of those away. Send us an email to gods at digigods.com, gods at digigods.com. Put your uh, name and address in the body of the email and in the subject line, uh, put swing, just S-W-I-N-G. And uh, we will, uh, on uh, July 7th, we're going to give you till July 7th, which is a Sunday, uh, as long as we get our, that email by July 7th, we will be good, and we'll pick the winners, and uh, we will send you out your Blu-rays on uh, July 8th. So make sure we get that by July 7th. Swing in the subject line for Swing Kids. The other one is called T34. You're going to want to send us an email to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com, either of them, uh, and put T, just the letter T, that's it. Just put T in the subject line, and uh, we will uh, also by July seventh we will give you the uh, we'll pick some winners and send four very happy people their copy of the Blu-ray of T thirty four. And here is what T thirty four is about. It's a uh, it's basically a uh, a POW escape movie. Uh, they're not putting on a show like in the other one. They're they're putting on an escape. Uh, this is World War Two. And uh, the idea here is that they're going to escape uh, largely because they have the remains of a damaged T-34 tank. Now, what I got out of this was, oh, somebody had an old Russian tank that was available for a movie. <laughs> so they wrote a movie around a tank. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and this is the result. It, but you know what? Uh, Good on them because they were able to. Uh, it's a Russian film, yeah. and uh, you, there is an English language version on this. But uh, you know, you can. It's an English dub, but uh, really, it's actually quite. Uh, it's quite interesting. So um, yeah, I, 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 you you see them cutting the corners, and you sort of know how they put it all together. But it's it's worth it. It's worth checking out. So. Anyway, that's T34. Giving away four copies. Send us an email to gods or uh, gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. Put T in the subject line, body and uh, uh, address in the uh, in the body of the email. Uh, so let's see what else we got here. Um, we also have uh, the movie Soulmate. Uh, Soulmate is a lovely, lovely, lovely movie. Uh, it it's one of the, you know, there are more and more Chinese films that are looking at the issues that are, are addressing young people in modern day China. And it changes all the time. As the society changes, the challenges of every generation change. Uh, and uh, they're, they're all good because they all, in some way, aren't just about China. They're all about what's going on outside China as well. And uh, that's part of the struggle inside China. This thing won a ton of awards internationally at various festivals. Uh, it was in a ton of festivals. And um, it uh, it was famous because they the two actresses who star in it uh, both won Best Actress. They tied for the Chinese Film Award. No, oh. which I don't know if that was rigged or not. It seems you know mm, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, it I seems, hadn't thought about it that way, but I'm okay with it, mm. even if it wasn't, uh, or especially if it wasn't. So the uh, this is basically about two different. Um, Two different women over a very, very long time, over many, many, many decades, uh, just trying to make their place in the world. And uh, Zhu Dong Yu and Ma Shun, who uh, play the two women, are both absolutely wonderful. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I wouldn't call it a, um, I guess it's kind of a Douglas Sirk film in Mandarin, you could almost say. It really does have a Douglas Sirkian kind of melodramatic quality to it. Uh, especially the way that he treated women in his films, but it's mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm gonna it's it's on blue it's on DVD not on Blu-ray, but it's also it's really really good. 
a record of sweet murder by Koji Shiraishi. Uh, this is from Unearthed Films, obviously a Japanese movie. And uh, Koji Shiraishi is uh, is a bit of a genre director, but he's 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 a really crazy genre director. Like he gives Mike a run for his money. <laughs> he really does. He he gives Mike looks at his these, these movies and says that guy's nuts. Uh, so the, what's the, here's, here's the, here's the setup and, and here's the, here's the tagline, Tim, you're going to love the tagline mm. to bring back one soul. He must kill 27 people. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. Oh right? my God. Uh, yeah. So this is about a guy, um, who has, uh, escaped from a mental institution and, um, you know, I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah. That's all. All I'm going to tell you is, to bring back one soul, this guy who's escaped from a mental institution must kill 27 people. I'm not going to tell you anything else, because it would give too much away. Uh, but it's uh, it's actually quite funny. Uh, I know I shouldn't say that, but it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's, it's tweaked. It's a twisted movie. Uh, let's see. Uh, Facets, I should make a quick note. Facets has re-released uh, Mil- Miklos Jansko's Electra, My Love, which is a, uh, a, which is a really an extraordinary film made in 1974, one of the uh, kind of the, Hungar- the great Hungarian and Eastern European films of that particular period. It's not Czech New Wave. It's like the Hungarian, uh, it's concurrent from Hungary around the same time as a certain part of the Czech New Wave. But it's a great film. It's been out before. It's been out of print for a long time. It's now back in print on DVD only from Facets. And uh, it is absolutely well worth checking out. Jansko is one of the uh, all-time great Hungarian filmmakers, one of the all-time great European filmmakers, especially of the 1970s. And um, it's an absolutely beautifully made film. It is just uh, pastoral and poetic. And uh, it, it is a... It it's uh, it effectively it tells the Electra myth, but it tells it in a Hungarian context, a modern day Hungarian context, and one that sort of draws parallels to Hungarian society during mm. the during the Cold War under communism, and it's it's really smart and uh, takes it does a lot of uh, throws a lot of cinematic twists and tricks at you. It's a beautiful beautiful film. Uh, we've also got Alex Lutz's film. Uh, was, this was the closing film from the uh, Critics Week of the 2018 uh, Cannes Film Festival. Guy, G-U-Y. It's guy in English. It's Guy in French. And uh, it, is, uh, it is one of these weird French... Um, uh, I don't want to call it a comedy. It's kind of like a social... Well, I guess it is a social comedy in, in a certain sense. But... Uh, there's a it's about a guy this young this young guy he's a journalist and he discovers that his father the father he's never known might actually be this uh, 70-something-year-old French pop singer who's a long 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 past his prime and um so he decides to get close to him by pretending to make a documentary about him and you know the comedy presumably writes itself but there's some very very um, poignant stuff in here as well, and the way it's done is uh, very unusual for this type of film. It definitely, uh, it definitely pushes the envelope, even for Critics Week stuff. It's worth checking out. From 2018, and the film is Guy G U uh, Y. Let's see. You want to do some docs? Well, you got some other stuff. stuff. Okay, let's do. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah, do a hit, few docs. Hit a couple of those. Uh, we'll, we'll break it up, and I'll do some foreign, more some of the rest of the foreign on, later. On top of this is uh, from Frontline, and, and one wonders how they were doing this. It's the Mueller investigation from PBS from Frontline. The Mueller investigation, a Frontline report. <laughs> excuse me, from um, a documentarian, uh, uh, Michael Kirk. Uh, it's a sixty-minute documentary. Uh, that offers an inside look into the investigation of the president. Uh, this is a yeah. They must have simply been uh, following along and putting it together and putting it together as what, it was going. But that's what the frontline people do. Whenever yeah. there is something that they say we're eventually going to have to do a frontline on this, they, they just go of, to work on it. They go to work on and, it, uh, and then that way, when the thing sort of comes to fruition within a month or two, uh, which is where we are now, they they can actually cosmetic. They just, they just piece together what they've been working on all along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and sort of sum it up a little bit. And, yeah. uh, uh, what I do like about it is they don't make a whole lot of decisions about it. They simply present it, Yeah, uh, yeah. which is good. Uh, the, yeah. Well, uh, we, need, we need that. We need less editorializing on, yeah. on this yeah. stuff. We yeah. can figure it out a little bit later. Fewer, fewer talking heads. 
Um, Genesis 2.0. This was a neat film by Christian Free. Uh, it's about these folks <clears throat> um, who who go on uh, in, to, to 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 Siberia and they start looking for uh, woolly mammoth bones. Uh, occasionally, a tusk or something like that will be found, but not not that much. But they find an almost intact intact woolly mammoth carcass. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, really, kind of actually. And what and what that's going to mean in terms of things that they can do, including possibly using genetics, the power of bioscience, to actually bring back a woolly mammoth. You take a little bit. This is a real Jurassic so Park. So in other words, they've never thing. seen Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 yeah, it, it, particularly Jurassic Young Park people. Four. Uh, they, they they always kill us people. So you know. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, it is an interesting story though of uh the possible resurrection of the. Woolly Mammoth. Uh, what do we have here? CeeLo. Oh, this is just a lovely, lovely film here. Um, uh, the Aca the Acacamba Desert in Chile is one of the darkest places on the planet. Therefore, a whole bunch of observatories have been built there or stationed there. Uh, this is about uh, 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 some people who are going to the Acacamba Desert to look at the night sky and search for planets. But it's also about the beauty and the majesty of what, it, of what it actually looks like and feels like to be in the darkness. You know, we think that we know what it feels like to be in the middle of nighttime yeah. in, in the big cities. Yeah. I remember being a kid, though, uh, who was born in the South. I was born in Tennessee, grew up in St. Louis. But we would always go back to Tennessee to visit, you know, the grandparents and all this kind of stuff down, down there. And wait, when I was a little kid, late 60s, early 70s, it was still pitch black dark in places in Tennessee, uh, and uh, completely different than what it is now. Now we have spillage from all of the lights to, that um, populate our cities, which is funny because here in Los Angeles we have the Griffith Observatory, which is one of the great old observatories, I think built in the 30s, yeah. uh, that's still at work and, and has been remodeled and everything. But our city spills so much light out into the sky that you really can't see what you – uh, could see way back in the day. Anyway, this is an absolutely extraordinary film. Um, if you've never looked up at the sky uh, in, in a truly, truly pitch black environment and seen the millions upon billions of stars in the sky, um, yourself, if you've never done that, uh, watch this movie. It'll get you there kind of close. And I imagine there are a lot of young people, a lot of kids who haven't done that. You know, I, I doubt that Hero has done that yet. No. You know, being yeah. a kid from, yeah. you know, from L.A. Constructing Albert, this is a really interesting uh, documentary about, well, um, there was a much-honored Spanish sh chef of a, of a restaurant called Ibuli. It closed back in 2007. It was run by a very important uh, a restauranteur. This restauranteur had working for him over the course of the life of this entire, this very important restaurant, a younger brother. And when, he, when the, the big brother closed his restaurant in 2011, the younger brother, Albert Adrea, set out to make a name for himself, and he started opening up these restaurants in Barcelona, ultimately opening up five of the most important restaurants, noted restaurants uh, in Barcelona. Tickets, 41, Bodega 1900, Patica, uh, and, a, and a couple others. I think one was called Enigma. Each one of them very, very different in the kind of cuisine that they served up. And it's just one of those things where uh, when he gets the chance to step out of the shadow of his older brother who ran this extremely important restaurant for so years, you realize that... Uh, there was a genius in the mist all the time, constructing Albert. If you're a foodie, it's a really, really neat uh, doc that you might want to check out. All right. I got a few uh, few more foreign films here that I'm going to plow through. Uh, really interesting Italian, Italian neorealist throwback film from Giuseppe Piccioni, P-I-C-C-I-O-N-I, -I, uh, called Not of This World. This is also, excuse me, this is also from Facets. This was from, made in 1999. Uh, and it's uh, about a woman who's about to uh, become a nun, take her final vows, and then finds a baby. And uh, the search to reunite the baby with its, its, its birth family is essentially what becomes a kind of uh, magical realist journey. And it, uh, it's like a combination of neorealism and magical realism. And it is, uh, it is really, uh, it's really fascicle, uh, fascinating. It's, um, it's lyrical and yet kind of gritty at the same time. It's a really interesting movie. It's well worth checking out. It has a lot to say about faith and religion and family and, uh, and just destiny in general. It is called Not of This World. It's by Giuseppe Piccioni, and it is from Facets, who is really putting a lot of good stuff out again. And then we have a couple more from the Retro Africa Collection. 
of uh, indie picks. Both of these are uh, Sollywood films, South African apartheid level uh, era films from the uh, mid 80s. The first one is called Lola, which is basically about a woman who plays basketball and then wants to make more of her life, or not basketball, uh, volleyball, mm. and then wants to make more of her life. And it becomes kind of a bad news bears with volleyball set in South Africa. I love it. Yeah, it's sweet. It, it you know what? It's uh, it's inspiring. It's a, it's uplifting, and it's female centered, which is uh, is nice and unusual. Now, Tim, I'm going to give you the plot of this one, okay? Mm-hmm. And you tell me if this sounds similar to something. <laughs> it, this is a South. This is a South African apartheid era kung fu movie. It's a kung fu police thriller mm-hmm. called One More Shot. One uh, more shot. It's about a guy known as Ten Ten. Mm-hmm. He's a criminal. Mm-hmm. He's just gotten out of prison, and now he's got to he's got to lay a trap for this guy, this former boxer whose name is Johnny Tough. Does this start to sound a lot mm-hmm. like Dolomite? Mm-hmm. It's very Dolomite. Mm-hmm. It is Dolomite. That's insane. Um, uh, he's not a pimp, right? No, I mean, yeah. that's all that. But but all the beats of this thing, he's just come out of prison. He's got yeah. a good thing. He's got, and then and then you know, there's, there's like a sex trafficking thing in it. And I'm and, and I'm thinking, this is this it's is very really, Dolomite. Very, they change it just enough, but it's still basically Dolomite. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the the fighting is not bad. Uh, it's made for a buck fifty. Then it's already better than Dolomite. <laughs> <laughs> if the fighting's not bad. That's some of the worst <laughs> fake kung fu ever done. But he improved on it. When yeah, he did the speed it up, the undercrank yeah, stuff, yeah, for yeah, the human yeah. tornado. I uh, got a Thai film called Motel Mist, uh, which is it, it makes its intentions known. This is not a family film. You have a woman wearing oh, a ball, yeah, yeah, wearing yeah. a ball gag yeah, uh, as the artwork. Uh, basically, it, it takes it's multiple st- interlocking storylines in a Bangkok motel, and they're all kind of tweaked and weird. Uh, some real kinky sexual stuff going on in one of them. Uh, there's somebody who thinks that they're being uh, chased by aliens, who's in another, and uh, it's all it's like this is the hotel you don't want to check into. Um, so it, 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 Thai films can be uh, very very high production value but also very edgy. And this is both of those things. It is beautifully shot. Uh, it's not, an, uh, not a martial arts film like, the, you know, like a lot of the stuff that makes it over here. It's not an epic, but the acting is very good. It's just really edgy. And a lot of the fetishistic stuff in here is kind of tough to watch. Mm. This is definitely NC-17 level stuff. It's not rated, but it's definitely pushing the, uh, pushing the envelope. So, uh, but it... You know what? It's stylishly made, and I give the I give him all the credit in the world for the uh, for the direction. Got a couple of Jean Luc Godard films Jean here. Luc, uh, Elas pour moi, and uh, First Name Carmen. Not among his best, mm. but uh, if you're a Godardian, if you're a big Godard fan, you'll obviously vibe to him. They're uh, separated by a decade. Uh, Elas pour moi is a slight bit more recent. That was from 1993. And uh, this is the only film, to my knowledge, I think, that he made was Gerard Depardieu. They didn't work together or anything else, did they? No. Was I Depardieu just one and done with yeah. Elas Bermois? Yeah, well, you know, Godard is, in, is irritating. He, he's, he annoys everybody. <laughs> well, I'm a fan. He annoys uh, everybody. But, you know, it was just me. So he's basically, uh, he's basically retelling the Greek myth of uh, Alchemine and Amphitryon, which is, uh, which is some kind of a caution. It's not a myth that I'm terribly familiar with, but presumably it's the story of... Uh, a god coming down to earth, becoming a human being, and you know, trying to experience life as a human being. Uh, I don't really see much Greek myth in this. It's just very Godardian weirdness, but at least it does have a story. It's not one of his sort of uh, meandering of love. Yeah, love. it was his meandering uh, visual essays where it's just there, there, there's no <laughs> acting, there's no story. Them. I hate those. Uh, He's just been on that trip for too many years now. He's actually working with actors here: Gerard Depardieu and and, and uh, Francois Musy, uh, Nathalie Vidal. Uh, you know, a lot of very very talented people. So, uh, and there are a few interesting, weird little twists in it. So, it's not utterly terrible. It's it's watchable, and De- Depardieu is very good. There's also a good commentary on here from uh, Sam Dan, who's a uh, film critic that I've never heard of, and then uh, from. 1983 is first name Carmen, which is a Godard film that has completely uh, disappeared from people's memory. He actually stars in it himself as this guy, this kind of rambling, uh, meandering moron um, who lets his niece 
stay in his house while he's in an asylum. Uh, Marushka Detmers, who, has, who was once a very controversial uh, actress, uh, a, a Dutch actress who played in French films, she did, you know, uh, some pretty risque stuff. Mm. Uh, she plays the niece, she plays Carmen, the title character, and does it very, very wonderfully. Um, but then this thing takes a completely weird twist. There's like, you know, it becomes like uh, killing Zoe at a certain mm. point. You know, there are these bank robbers, and uh, she winds up having a relationship with one of them, and then it's like, you know, then there's a kidnapping, and suddenly it's all over the map, and and none of it really makes much sense. Um, it's just all, it, it's really, uh, it's like he's almost trying to piss you off. <laughs> you, you know, it's like he says, you know what, I'm going to tell a story, and then I'm just going to make a bunch of stuff up as I go along, and it's, and you know what, maybe I'll change my mind, and then maybe I'll change it back, and maybe I'll do something for no reason at all, uh. because I can, because I'm Jean-Luc Godard. <gasps> okay, fine. Be that way. At least there's a narrative. At least there is kind of a narrative. It, it, by the end, you, you're not really sure what you've seen. You're like, I don't even remember what order things happen. <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, there is a short film by Godard on here as well, which also doesn't make any sense. And then uh, Craig Keller does the uh, commentary for both the short film and the feature. Both of those Godard films are from Kino, and God bless you. Nobody else was going to release these movies, so yeah. you did. I got a couple of more uh, docs yeah. here, including yeah. this extremely good one called Brave Girls. Uh, it's about these three uh, young women uh, who are going back to school. Uh, small, small community in India. This is in, uh, uh, with English subtitles. Small community in, in, uh, in India, and they're, they're going back to school to finish their secondary education. Uh, for the first time in a very long time, they, they can sort of see a future for themselves when their families begin preparations for their weddings. These are young girls, 13, 14 years old. And they are put between this rock and the hard spot of uh, 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 family and community expectations for young women and their actual true desires to get educations and go on and get formal educations and perhaps uh, uh, do something else with their life. And this is what this movie is about. It's hard to believe sometimes uh, here uh, in, in America, 2019 in America, uh, where we are so advanced in so many things, backwards in a few things, but so advanced in so many things, that there are many, many places in the world where women, young girls, are still treated this way and denied educations and, and uh, cultural values and mores uh, simply don't recognize that it makes no sense whatsoever to not allow um, your children out in, in the context of any culture to get the best possible education they can. Anyway, uh, it's a lovely, lovely movie called Brave Girls about these young women having to make this choice. The Brink uh, it was a very interesting doc uh, about Steve Bannon. Uh, that came out last year. I, I love this doc. Very, you know, what's interesting about this doc is is the character Steve Bannon. Uh, he is, in fact, who he appears to be. Completely, uh, you he know, owns it. Yeah, he owns, uh, and he, he lets them. He understands it, and he owns it. Here's what's amazing about it: the filmmakers are clearly hostile to him. Yeah, and he knows this. Yeah, 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 and he and just he leans has, into it, and he has no problem. Basically, opening up every little tiny. There, there might be one moment in the film, I think, where he where he says, uh, "Yeah, let, let, let's go go away from the cameras." Like yeah. he wants something, but otherwise, he has no problem showing them when he's upset, when they've lost an election, when they've won, when he's being arrogant, when he's being charming. Like he, and he argues with them in the car. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, at one, and, and he's sitting there, he's arguing with him. He's like, "Ah," yeah. and and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, that's really whatever you think of Steve Bannon. It takes a certain gut to to just say, you know what? I think I'm going to let these people who hate me follow me around yeah, and make a documentary yeah, about yeah, me. I'm yeah, okay yeah, with that. Yeah, they, particularly you know because Steve is not the most. Uh, he, he's kind of a, dis a disheveled individual. D kind of. He does not. He, Steve doesn't. <laughs> I think. I think the president calls him sloppy Steve. <laughs> he just. Uh, he's, he yeah. never. The guy's worth like two hundred million dollars yeah. or something. I mean, he made a ridiculous fortune. Made uh, a chunk of that money in the movie business. Yeah, and and yeah, he made some terrible movies. And he yeah. even uh, what you know I what, covered that, a couple of them. That's funny too. That's probably one of my favorite things in the movie. He makes he makes this just completely shameless do, uh, propaganda film, and he's watching it and he's glowing about it. And and he even says to the filmmakers, he goes, he goes, this is a great piece of propaganda. Yeah, and he, and he stops for a moment. and He goes. I mean, you, you, you probably think propaganda is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> it's like, good. it's hysterical. He's owning it. He's just totally owning yeah, it. Yeah, well, propaganda is just a word. Yeah. Uh, the Michelin star, uh, your restaurants get these Michelin stars. It's, yeah. It's extremely interesting We have, we have some two stars in L.A. Yeah, now. Yeah. Finally. And, of course, we've been ignored for years. San Francisco had one or two. I think, I think they've uh, got some the, three stars. The, uh, up, up there. Yeah. But, 
But, you know, Michelin stars is a hell of a thing. Uh, this doc is called Michelin Stars, Tales from the Kitchen. Basically, it simply goes behind the scenes of how the Michelin stars are awarded. You know, so the, the way people go out and they, they do these things. And, you know. There's a there are politics. There yeah. are politics. Let's oh, just sure. There are politics involved. Uh, I'm a yoga guy. I ingar hatha. I ingar yoga is the sort of yoga that I do. This documentary is called I ingar. I ingar is a person. Uh, BKS Amazing Iyengar. Story. Uh, yeah, really interesting story. He's very. He's still alive. Elderly man. I, I did it when I injured my back years yeah. ago in an accident. It, it, because uh, it's back oriented. It's back oriented. Yeah. It's uh, it's um, it's not as breathing or oriented as some of the other no, uh, styles no. of, of yoga. It's really about deep and hard stretching. This and way he healed. And, he he was a cripple and he healed yeah, himself. He healed himself. Amazing. Yeah. And, and he's still alive and, and still getting around. This follows. Um, it tells historically the story of him, and the, the what what. What lies behind the theory of his very particular yoga practice? Iyengar uh, is a very interesting film. If you're into yoga, you should definitely watch this. If you're not into yoga, you should watch it to figure out what yoga is all about. Uh, so let me hit a few more foreign films here. I've got one from Cult Epics, who always digs up some really, really wild stuff. Uh, a cult filmmaker by the name of Pim de la Para made Susan Sandra Olga actually my nights with Susan Sandra Olga and Julie that's the that's the name of the movie my nights with Susan Olga uh Susan Sa oh boy I'm going to get this right <laughs> my nights with Susan Sandra Olga and Julie mm -hmm. so uh the uh this is this is a a crazy crazy movie uh this was made in the Netherlands in 1975 I'm not sure that Pim de la Para is necessarily the director's real name because a lot of these directors came from other countries, went to the Netherlands, changed their names into something Dutch so that nobody know who they were or what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, but this is a weird kind of um, this is a weird kind of of a thriller sex romp, and they call it a sex and psycho suspense mystery thriller, which is basically what it is. I it, it's a it's a it's it really a strange strange movie. Um, about a bunch of people who uh, they're in this farmhouse and they uh, they have sex and they kill and I don't really know how else you kind of frame it out. Um, it's uh, it's titillation. It is uh, it's purely of its era. It's a real 75, 1975 vibe to it. It really really feels of its moment and. Um, it's culty and it's a little weird and it's fringy and if you like these kinds of things you'll you'll totally vibe to this. It's really very much of that moment and of that particular genre. It's not for everybody, but it is my nights with Susan, Sandra, Olga, and Julie. And uh, wow, what a what a freaking movie it is. Um, then we have another one that's kind of in the same vein from Redemption, the Jordi. Gijo movie, Devil's Kiss. This is from uh, Kino and the Redemption Line. Uh, this was made in 1975, right about the same time. And uh, it is also one of these weird Euro culty things. This was a uh, French-Spanish co-production in 1975. And I don't know who Jordi Gijo is. That sounds like another name that may very well be a fake name. Not familiar with him. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's almost, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's it's almost f comical at this mm. point to to watch this. Uh, this is about a uh, a countess whose husband has killed himself, and so she becomes now a medium in the wake of her husband's death, and uh, gets together with this telepathic professor to uh, for stage a seance for a duke. Uh, and you know, at this point, you go, "What? Yeah, what is this about?" Yeah. And somehow, a dwarf shows up at a certain point, and you start to think, "Is this a David Lynch movie?" And uh, I, uh, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it doesn't really go anywhere. It just gets weirder and weirder, and stranger and stranger. And at a certain point. Uh, it becomes like Frankenstein, and I, it, it doesn't really. It's it, but it's a strange movie. Uh, it's called Devil's Kiss by Jordi G. Joe, which has got to be a pseudonym. Woman at War 
Uh, got a little bit of heat this last year. This was a Magnolia film. It was submitted for uh, Oscar consideration. It did not get nominated. But uh, this is an Icelandic film uh, about a woman activist who goes out and she's she's basically trying to. Uh, I mean, she's you know she has her normal day job, but she secretly is like a not a superhero, but she's like an outlaw, right? She's got a kind of a double life as a Robin Hood kind of figure where she goes out. And uh, she's known as the woman of the mountain. And she sabotages uh, all of these, um, uh, these power lines because she's trying to stop the activities of a certain aluminum corporation no. that, is, uh, that is pillaging the, uh, the area there. So anyway, um, it, and it winds up – what's interesting about it is it winds up becoming a family story too. There's, a, there's an adoption narrative that sort of comes in from left field but makes it quite interesting. It's not – it's not exactly what you think, and it doesn't go where you think it's going to go. I, I actually think it's a, a very good film. It's not perfect, but it's really, really intriguing. Mm. And then, uh, let's see, I'm going to throw uh, here. I'll, I'll do this one. I got, I got two more here that I'll do. Actually, I got three more. Let me, let me do three more, and then I'll throw it back to you. Okay. Uh, the Sower is a uh, really interesting French film by Marine Franson, who's a very talented new director. This is from Film Movement on DVD. Uh, a little bit like The Beguiled here. This takes place in 1851. And uh, the, there's this farming village that the emperor has, uh, uh, the, the, the new Napoleon, uh, this is like Napoleon, not Napoleon III, whoever the Napoleon is in 1851, he's, um, all, of the, uh, all the men have been arrested in the farming village. So the women aren't getting any sexual gratification. So uh, they've decided, well, we're just, if anybody comes here, we're, just gonna, we're all going to sh- pass him around. We're going to make him very happy and let him kind of have all of us. And um, then, uh, you know, like in The Beguiled, a certain guy comes, but they, they aren't able to do it because he does, in fact, sort of uh, seduce each of them individually and in very unusual ways. And uh, it threatens their, their friendships and everything that they have built up. It's, uh, it's a really, really interesting film. It's very well done. It includes a, a short film that uh, Marine Franson did previously called uh, Les Voisins, The Neighbors, a uh, 20-minute short film. It's really, really incredibly well done. She's a very talented director, and all the actresses are superb. I do recommend it, The Sower. We also have a Luis Bunuel film, A Woman Without Love, which uh, has been re-released by Facets. This is from 1952. Uh, one of his Mexican year films, an adaptation of the Maupassant story Pierre and uh, Pierre et Jean, uh, which is very kind of classically Bunuel. It's not the best transfer, but it's the only transfer you're going to get. And, uh, you know, it's another, you you know, he's skewering the bourgeoisie and it's a comedy of manners with a little bit of weirdness in it. And, uh, you know, it it is what it is. It's a good film, but it's not a great transfer. Just be aware of that. It would be great to have this restored on Blu-ray, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. So if you want to see the uh, Luis Bunuel film, A Woman Without Love from 1952 when he was in Mexico, uh, you're going to have to get this Facets DVD best you got. Mm. And then the last uh, foreign language film is Mademoiselle Paradis by uh, Barbara Albert. This is this was at the uh, Toronto Film Festival in 2017 and uh, is um, I want to say on some level it's a little bit uh, kind of in the same vein as uh, oh boy what are some what are some period films it's um, Barry Lyndon-ish, maybe a little bit. Uh, it takes place in Vienna in the 1700s, and it's the story of a uh, woman who was uh, blind, a brilliant blind pianist, and who was also a friend of Mozart's. Oh, and right, and it's um, it's 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 a it's really, I mean, it's almost an extraordinary uh, true story that you at the end you just think that can't possibly be true that could not possibly have all happened yeah. there has to be some fabrication there and I can't tell you what actually does happen but it's um, it really is it's, it's a great story it's amazing to me this has never been told before uh, it's a 97 minute film in German and French and uh, that's from First Run Features really 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 worth checking out that is, it's, a, it's a terrific film Mademoiselle Paradis from the very very talented director Barbara Albert mm. Uh, fabulous. I got a couple of more docs over here. Um, all quite good, as a matter of fact. From Icarus Films, The Good Breast. This is a very, very powerful film uh, that explores um, a current phenomenon uh, ha- having something to do with advances in mammography and, and, uh, and other things uh, that have women making the radical decision to have uh, radical mastectomies. 
uh, either because uh, there is a, perhaps a genetic um, strain of breast cancer that runs through their family. Uh, but, but very often, it, it is being found that these radical mastectomies are very likely not, ne uh, not necessary, that, that what's being found by these new very powerful mammographies um, are in fact cancerous tissue, but it is highly unlikely that that cancerous tissue will develop into breast cancer. It depends on all kinds of things. It's not a spot on science. Yet um, some physicians and some women are being led to make these very sort of radical decisions about that and, and, and uh, mastectomies and, and um, uh, reconstructive surgery and all that kind of stuff. This follows a surgeon, Dr. Lauren uh, Shaper, who believes that fear and ignorance are fueling an alarming rate of medically unnecessary mastectomies in America. Wow. Uh, it's a very interesting investigation to this. I, I, con I conclusions, uh, n n not a lot of conclusions are made, but the investigation itself is absolutely fascinating and extremely important, particularly if you have, happen to have women in your family that you love. Uh, that Way Madness Lies, a, a first-run feature. This documentary um, is super powerful. And in my family, uh, there have been a few people that have had one sort of a mental illness or another, sometimes bipolar, sometimes yep. uh, schizophrenia. We all, we all got them. Uh, it's, it's in the family. This, this one is all about um, what you do when your brother uh, plainly starts to show signs of, um, of slipping away. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a really, really powerful film by Sandra Lacau. And I, you should see it uh, just so that you recognize that you are not alone if you are dealing with something like that in your family as well. Um, from the uh, wonderful uh, late Claude Landsman, director of Shoah, we have um, um, Shoah for Sisters. So when, when that film was made, it, he had much more material than he could conclude in the, in, in the final film. Um, a bit of what was left out was the story of these four particular women. And he decided to go back. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah and, yeah, and and to gather these particular stories together about these four women and tell their stories and of how they actually survived the Holocaust. So Ruth Elias, Ada Lickman, Hannah Martin, and Paula Bersnu um, are the women who he follows in this documentary. And it's just a fascinating story of bravery and perseverance, like you would not believe. I mean, if you've seen Shoah, yeah, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you know the basics. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This just personalizes it in a very specific way, as these four women tell their actual stories, and they will just blow you away. This is the, the women like this is why I, I, I love yeah. you, 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 dude. I'm sorry, men. <laughs> Men have nothing the, no. on women. No idea. When it comes to perseverance and survival, women know how to get it done. Yep, men, men just figure you have a fight. That's yeah. not the same thing. No. Um, one of the best documentaries last year, as it, was, it was on my top ten list of documentaries. Actually, it was at the top of my top ten li list of document docs last year, is Hell County This Morning, This Evening by filmmaker Ramil Ross. This film is just so beautiful. It's hardly, you can hardly watch it. Hell County is a county in Alabama. And what Ramil does, uh, Ramil grew up in the city, but his father grew up in the South, and his father used to tell him the stor stories about having grown up in the South. Uh, it's an interesting thing. I interviewed Ramil uh, during the period. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, International Documentary Association. I do a lot of their panels. So I did the panel for Ramil's movie, and we had a really wonderful conversation. Very similar lives, he and I. He's a young black man, younger than me. His father is about my age. Interestingly wow. enough, about, Ooh. About, 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 about 58, 59 years old. And in talking to Ramil, and he told me these stories that his father told him, and I, I, and I thought to myself, your father and I had the same life. Because <laughs> uh, his father was from Hell County, Alabama. I was born in Tennessee. And, yeah. and you grow up going back, going back there. We grew up in the city, but we were always going back down south. So we developed these very urban sort of lifestyles and attitudes, and our perspective on the south was very different from our cousin's who remained wow. in the South. And what Ramil does is he goes back down South, and in this very poetic film, he looks at the lives of black folks in this particular county and then connects their lives, where they are now and how they exist now, right back through slavery. There's a sequence in this film where he's... Um, where uh, he's all these cypress trees, all of these cypress trees. He films all these, and, and he, it's just these long takes of these cy cypress trees. And then he does this wonderful thing where he dissolves uh, his take from present day of those cyper tr cypress trees to images taken long ago of the exact same, same stand of trees, but with what we have come to call strange sure. fruit hanging from them. Mm. So these trees that we look at now and these children are playing under 
once held the bodies of African Americans who were hunted. That's some a of them a of... hundred years ago. Some of them only fifty or sixty years. And with that, we are done. Uh, we will not be back next week. We'll be back the week after, after the Fourth of July holiday. If you're in, if you're in the United States, enjoy the Fourth of July holiday. Mm-hmm. If you're not, enjoy not having to put up with us for another week. Uh, and uh, send us those. Uh, you got an extra week to uh, win those Blu-rays. Just send it in with T or swing. T, the letter T or swing will get you in. Gods at digigods.com. Gods at cinegods.com. See you in two weeks. Thank you.